what was india in 2014 when he took over india was in a septic shock what we call in medical terminology it means there is a significant drop in blood pressure that can lead to respiratory failure or a heart failure stroke dysfunction of organs and possibly death take the same analogy what was ailing india big scams whether it is coal 2g and so on there was a policy paralysis no one was taking action inflation was hovering around 10% economy was underperforming and the gdp growth was 4.6% in 2014 non performing assets of the banks unofficially were at 15% though officially they showed 6-7% but raghuram rajan accepted that lot of npas were created during the upa period and i was involved in lot of debt restructuring that period so i know it was over 15% many public sector undertakings were incurring losses pusu banks were always asking for money for recapitalization we were grouped among the fragile five nations and we know what is fragile it means huge leakage of resources and funds not reaching the people poor tax collections black money and parallel economy was the order of the day infrastructure development was very absent and government did not have money apart from these economic issues there were social issues like poor sanitation there were no toilets women were suffering cleanliness were lacking that created stumbling block for our economic development doctors would first give antibiotics to treat the septic shock once the body gets rid of the infection then the doctors would prescribe vitamins and nutrients that would help to gain energy and help the patient to start walking and running likewise our economic conditions must be stabilized before we start a marathon race i would say during the first 5 years modi ji laid the foundation with a focus on some key social issues swachh bharat and toilets right people used to make fun those days what is the swachh bharat and you and made a study in 2019 and said more than 100 million house rural household were benefited and 500 million people got clean toilets basically what it means is to reduce the burden of the government's budget in basic health care free gas connections helped women toiling in the smoking kitchen jandan yojana was a great success it helped 52 crores of people as the money reached into their bank account without leakage demonetization as everybody knows it is most criticized by all the people but supreme court recently upheld that decision but it helped to roll out the digitalization of the economy in 2017 then we come to digital india drive aadhar linking with pan digi lockers and all help the economy and improve the governance in delivery number of tax payers increase substantially faceless assessment roll out of schemes reaching the ultimate beneficiaries while generating lakhs of jobs the real effect was seen during the covid lockdown formalization of the economy is the cornerstone of this drive Today, digital transactions are 76% of GDP compared to just 4% in 2015. These policy initiatives are literally changing the society's behavior, and the common man is happy that he need not waste time in doing physical transactions. How many of us go to the banks anymore? We hardly spend time, right? Now let's get to specific economic policy decisions. that put the foundation first i will talk about the corporate taxation 15% and 25% slab are at par or even less than some of the many advanced countries this has helped in more than doubling the corporate collection it was 450000 crores in 2014 today it is 950000 crores next is the gst 
the world hailed India's boldness to venture into something like GST. It stopped the corruption and the leakages. It also gives the predictability of how the ease of doing business will happen and what is the predictable rates for these taxes. The net outcome of buoyancy of tax revenues is increased infrastructure spend. What used to be at 1.5% of GDP, today it is 3.5%, which would not only mean a boost for all the core sectors, whether it is cement, steel and all of that, but it also creates huge job opportunities and makes it attractive for FDI. Next is implementation of the bankruptcy and insolvency code. Previous governments tried several methods and they were did, did not have the political will to bring such a code because it is quite drastic, right? They instead uh, uh, tried several mechanisms which ultimately failed. The result is that NPAs after implementation has come down from 15% to 5% today. And all our banks are doing very well. I'm talking about public sector banks, not just that. There is a complete behavioral change in the minds of the borrowers. And they have created a fear in the mind of the borrower that if you default, this is what is going to happen. No one thought like big industrialists would lose their control. Corporate debt in the process has come down from 62% to 50%. This helped saving taxpayers money, which was going into these public sector banks for recapitalization. No longer our GDP growth is dependent on bank lending because a lot of private money has come in. Right? Earlier, it used to be 22%, 23% corporate lending growth or banking credit growth. And we used to achieve 6-7% of GDP. Today, we are able to do without that uh, dependence. Next is RERA. Indian real estate was one of the major conduit for black money with inflated land prices across cities. Corruption was rampant. Total accountability was missing. Middle and lower middle class people could not even dream of owning a house or a flat. After RERA was implemented in 2016, a lot of transparency has been brought in. It is now difficult for the developers to divert funds for other projects by putting the buyers at risk. Atma Nidmar is one of the major initiatives. Now, we don't build bridges and toll roads for ego boost. It is an enabler for economic development. Let me give you a glimpse of parallel policy measures that is helping the growth momentum. We talked about Make in India initiative, industrial corridor development programs, ease of doing business, PM Gati Shakti National Master Plan, National Logistic Policy, PLI schemes, production linked incentive schemes. Now, we are producing much more mobile phones than anywhere in the past. How would these help India? Let me give you 10 major points. We will push our own homegrown brands, like how China did. Our exports would grow multifold, not just this China plus one policy. We will do multiplier effect here. Our consumer behavior will change as they get more money into their hand. Per capita income is going to increase. The, the demand will start happening. It would not be like China export policy. We will have our own domestic consumption, which will help to insulate the uh, uh, volatility of the world. Doing business will be much easier with the digitalization. Now, did you ever imagine 1,500 laws have been repealed in India, which were quite archaic? We, many of us, did not, even lawyers did not know such laws existed. Global brands will enter India that would help in good competition. And technology absorption will be very good. Better employment opportunities as our people get better skilled. It is going to be a knowledge-oriented economy. Don't forget that we have the youngest workforce in the world. Various sectors like tourism, hospitality, healthcare, and so on will have a booming business. Cost reduction will happen. And the products will become cheaper as the volume grows up. Stronger category penetration will happen. All this will help you to move towards a $5 trillion economy. After all this, where do we stand now? 
GDP in 2014 was 4.6%. Today we are at 7.6%. Food grains availability per person in 2023 is estimated to be around 232 kilos. With increased population, you know, we, use, we have increased 130 million people in the last 10 years. So India has been able to give uh, increased population and keep that availability of 232 kilos as opposed to 155 kilos in 200, 2014. Forex import cover. The previous government will always say we also increased, you know, Forex reserves. I agree. But we have to compare what was the Forex import cover which was around 7.3 months in 2014-14, whereas it is now 10.25 months. Inflation was hovering around 10%. Today, we are able to manage it at 5%. Don't forget, we have had Ukraine war, Ukraine-Russia war. Then we have had COVID. Then we are having the Middle Eastern crisis. All of that still, we have managed the inflation compared to the rest of the world. No more policy paralysis. Transparency is brought in. And from Fragile 5, now India is fifth largest economy in the world and on the way to become the third in the next few years. Cumulative foreign direct investment from 2000 to 2014 was around 324 billion. But in the last nine and a half years, we have got 647 billion. Our stock markets are witnessing high growth, which means investors have started trusting India growth story. Just see the DMAT accounts. In 2014, when I saw the numbers, I could not believe. It was just a mere 23 million DMAT accounts. Today, we have 150 million DMAT accounts. And this means inclusive growth in financial savings. Don't forget, we are not just there. We just started the journey. And as we say in Hindi, picture abhi baki hai. India has arrived on the world stage and next 25 years, no one can ignore India's growth. Hello, Tamil Shandangal. I am Rajavin Nagarajan. Peace Tamil and Peace Valley 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 Valley